Sammy and I wanted to reach out to you from our home to yours because we're sensing it's time to sound the trumpet and call the 24-7 tribes to get behind a prayer initiative called Unite 714. You probably know 2 Chronicles 714. It's when God promises that if we'll just humble ourselves and turn to him in prayer, he'll forgive our sins and heal our land. The model is really simple. Just pause to pray each day at 7.14 a.m. and 7.14 p.m. in unison with millions around the world. That's twice a day, one voice. We've been praying non-stop for 20 years and this is our biggest challenge yet. God's been preparing us. He's positioned us as a movement for this moment and the model we're going to use is Unite 714. Together, let's cry out to God for the healing of our lands from coronavirus and a spiritual awakening in our time. Good morning and welcome to our streamed service from Markiet Baptist Church. I'm going to lead us in prayer and then we're going to sing a great hymn of praise. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's pray together. Lord, there are so many obstacles that we can bring to worship. The hurt and anger we feel within us. The worries and concerns that fill our minds. Our awareness that life and our lives are being changed painful memories of the past that still causes anguish even now, the uncertainty and bleakness of our tomorrows, the emptiness, sorrow and doubt that fill our lives today. We do not find it easy to keep Christ at the centre, but open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus and we pray in his precious name. Amen. Let's worship together. i uh -huh. 
Just going to watch a short video now that introduces to us Psalm 46 and verses 1 to 2 and shows at a time of uncertainty there is always hope. And then after we've seen this video, I'm going to lead us in intercessory prayers. Let's watch the video.
Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the hope found in Psalm 46 verses 1 to 2, that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. And we thank you, Lord, for the prayers that are going up and down our land concerning the situations we're facing, not only here in the United Kingdom, but throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, would you hear and answer those prayers? Lord, you say, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And Lord, we pray for those who are going through a period of mourning at this time. Perhaps they've lost loved ones or know of people who have lost their lives through the coronavirus. Lord, grant peace and presence to those who are sad, for I pray in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we want to thank you for people who help practically at this time. We thank you for those who serve and care for us. And particularly, we thank you for the National Health Service. Thank you for what they're doing and the difference that's being made. We say thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. I was thinking, talking of the National Health Service, how just one person can make a massive um, difference. And one of those is Captain Tom Moore, who's 99 years of age. And yet in his old age, he's been walking around his garden and his aim has been to raise money for our National Health Service. And the latest figures I've got is in excess of £13 million has been raised. So well done, Captain Tom. Going to show another short video now and that video is basically a thank you for those who care for us the doctors and the nurses and so many more let's watch the video together What a great National Health Service we have. Well, we're going to continue in worship um, now. Actually, later in the service, we'll be looking at a new message based on Philippians and chapter 1. And I'll be talking about Paul and Silas. And they were in prison. And in the midst of their difficulties, they lifted up praises to God. And that's what we're going to do now as we continue to worship together. We're going to sing that great song and popular at Market Baptist Church in particular, which tells us that Jesus is our cornerstone. And then after that, we're going to proclaim God as our way maker in difficult times. Let's worship. blood and righteousness 
I dare not trust the sweetest frame But holy trust in Jesus' name My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus' name Christ alone, cornerstone Weak made strong in the Savior's love Through the storm He is Lord, Lord seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil
Come now to our new sermon series from the book of Philippians. We'll shortly be looking at some verses in chapter one. But before we do that, I thought it'd be a good idea to look at the background to the book of Philippians. How was the church established and why is Paul writing when he does? Well, the background to the church at Philippi is described in Acts chapter 16. It gives us the origin of the church and how God used Paul and Silas to start a new work in a city that had never heard the gospel. In fact, it was miraculous how Paul ended up in Europe, in Philippi, in the first place. And it came as a result of a vision he got of a man from Macedonia saying, come into this area to share the gospel. And that's exactly what Paul did. And in the first years of this Philippian church, they experienced success and they also experienced difficulties. A bit like the church in the 21st century, we have our success, but we have our difficulties as well. And as we look at Acts chapter 16, we see a wonderful example of a success. The first convert in Philippi. Let's read about it from verse 13 of Acts chapter 16. On the Sabbath, when we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer, we sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of them listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. So here's this lady, Lydia, and she's a successful businesswoman dealing in purple cloth. And we hear something about her. She was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptised, she invited us into her home. So this lady, Lydia, is a believer in God. The technical term is a God-fearer. But as a result of Paul's message, she's now come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and as Saviour. And not only her, but members of her household as well. And the wonderful thing that happens is she opens up her home. And we have in Acts chapter 16 in Philippi, the first house church. So there was a wonderful success. But as I've said, there was difficulties as well. And one of the difficulties comes up later in Acts chapter 16, where Paul and Silas are thrown into prison. The reason they're thrown into prison is because they shared the good news. One of the people listening to the message was a slave girl who was a fortune teller. And she was able to tell fortunes because she was demon possessed. After a period of time, Paul cast out that demon in the name of Jesus. She could no longer tell the future 
and our owner could no longer make money, so he stirred up trouble, and the result was Paul and Silas were thrown into prison. How did they respond? They were beaten, their backs were red raw. How did they respond? Well, verse 25 of our passage tells us. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. So that's how they responded. They responded in worship. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. And then moving on to verse 29, the jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? See, the jailer's life was in danger if the prisoners were to escape. What must I do to be saved? And Paul saw that as an evangelistic opportunity. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. So there is a difficult situation where Paul and Silas are thrown into prison. Rather than feel sorry for themselves, they are praising God. In the midst of their praise, a miraculous thing happens and the jail doors are thrown open. It becomes an opportunity to share the good news, not just with the jailer, but with his family as well. And they come into knowing Jesus as Lord and the Saviour and they get baptised as well. So that's just within a few days in Philippi, a wonderful situation where a successful business lady and members of a household come to faith. And then in the midst of a difficult situation, the Philippian jailer and his family come to faith as well. Well, by the time Paul writes to the church at Philippi, 10 years have passed and the church is thriving but it's also looking after Paul and it's 10 years later and Paul is in prison again this time is in prison in Rome and they continue to care for him they sent money and they sent a member of the congregation to help him there in Rome in fact Paul writes the book of Philippians for three main reasons and here they are he writes to acknowledge the gift that the church at Philippi have sent him. He writes to send back the brother that they sent to him called Epaphroditus. And he writes to teach them about the connection between Christian joy and suffering. And I was thinking that last reason for writing is so appropriate today. In many ways, we are suffering where we're confined to our homes with the coronavirus crises. And yet Paul can teach us through this letter that we can experience Christian joy. The book of Philippians has four chapters and each of those chapters tells us how to respond. And here are the four chapters. Chapter one, live as if God is in control. And that's what we're going to look at in our message today. Live as servants. That's chapter two. Chapter three, live a life of loss. Chapter four, live a life of generous friendship. So as I say, we're looking at the first message from chapter one, live as if God is in control. And the remarkable thing is that this is written in the midst of persecution and Paul is praying for the Philippian church. What does he pray? Well, it's there from verse one um, onwards from Philippians chapter one, but we're gonna focus on verse nine. And this is what he says. He says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure 
and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So in the midst of the difficulties he's facing by being imprisoned, Paul is praying for others. And we can do exactly the same as we're confined more or less to our homes. We have the privilege of praying for others, even if things are not going well for ourselves. Well, we've got three points in our message today in the context of Paul praying for the church at Philippi. And the first point is this, God's priorities. You see, Paul wants the church at Philippi to learn how to live as if God is in control. God's priorities must be upheld. We're looking now at verse 12 of this opening chapter where Paul says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. See, Paul as a prisoner had round the clock um, imprisonment where members of the palace guard were chained to him and they know that he is a Christian. And it gets better because in verse 14 we read, and because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord Jesus and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So not only have members of the um, palace guard heard the gospel, but those who were believers because of Paul's witness and example as sharing the good news more boldly. And that's God's priority, that the gospel must be central. Well, we go to read in verse 15 that some people are making life difficult for Paul whilst he's in prison. Well, what's his response? Well, let's look at the passage. It is true, says Paul, that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defence of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me whilst I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether through false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. See, the gospel is more important to Paul than his reputation or his personal comfort. And in good times and bad, he simply rejoices that God's priorities are being accomplished. And the question I asked is this, how about us? What role does God's priorities play in our lives because when our priorities align with line with God's priorities the result is peace and joy there it is in this passage the important thing is that in every way whether through false motives or true Christ is preached and because of this I rejoice well let's come now to our second point that we can learn from these opening verses of chapter one and it's this, trust God for the outcome. Reading from verse 19, For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Two important things there, prayer and the provision of God's spirit and Paul says through those two things what has happened to me in this prison in Rome will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will be in no way ashamed he says but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body whether by life or by death. 
The events didn't look promising for Paul, but it looks beyond the events and the things that he's going through and looks forward to the outcome. And this is what he says. He says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labour for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. A desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ will abound on account of me. See, God shows his glory by bringing outcomes that are greater than any sorrow, any sickness or any suffering. Tertullian, who was one of the early church fathers, puts it very, very well. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And the context there is a time of persecution and people were dying for their faith, but in the midst of it, the church was growing. A gentleman called L. E. Maxwell expands on what Tertullian says. He says, when she, that's the church, ceases to bleed, she ceases to bless. She can thrive through persecution, but never through peace and plenty. Paul does not see his life as something to be preserved, but rather as something to be spent in the service of God's kingdom. And that's how we need to look at our lives. In difficult circumstances, more often than not, the name of Jesus is glorified. And as Christians, we have a greater opportunity to share the good news. Let's go to our final point. And it's all about receiving suffering when it comes in our direction. And what Paul teaches is that when we go through difficult times, whatever they may be, we go through them together. We really do need each other as believers. Let's look at verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that we will be saved and that by God. For it is being granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle I saw I had, now hear that you still have. See, the Philippians use Paul's imprisonment as a chance for the community to express their love and support for him. And the conclusion is this, the church draws together during tough times. And we as a church and indeed our country are going through tough times. And the lesson of Philippians chapter one is that individually and as a church community, we can demonstrate that God is in control by living as if God is in control. Our actions become the message. Let's just pray together. Father God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the remarkable example of the Apostle Paul, who in difficult circumstances is used of God to proclaim the good news of the gospel. And Lord, in the situations that we face at this time, may we know your peace, presence 
and power. May your Holy Spirit lead us and guide us, not only to survive in the midst of difficulty, but to be a wonderful witness and example. For we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we've learned from our message today that God is able in each and every circumstance. And as we come towards the end of this stream service, we're going to close in worship by proclaiming God is able. Let's worship together. now we come to our closing prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we came in need and have received your grace. We came in our emptiness and we have been filled. We came in our sense of aloneness and we have been given a friend. We came in our brokenness and we have been made whole. Lord, we commit ourselves to seek your face and live for your glory all the days of the coming week, for we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Once again, the Lord bless you.